Archaeonauts, away! It's generally thought from a biblical perspective that astrology is forbidden by God to be used by his people. Why is this? Is this what it really says? Are there examples of astrology in the Bible itself? This is what God commands in Leviticus. You shall not eat any flesh with the blood in it. You shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. Leviticus 19.26 This is what he says about it in Deuteronomy. When you come into the land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens, or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 12. Earlier in Deuteronomy, he had this to say, And beware, lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you will be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. Deuteronomy 4, verse 19. On the surface, at least, the commands seem pretty clear, but is it really forbidden? There are other ways to interpret omens or tell fortunes besides astrology, so maybe it didn't include astrology in that command. But in the passage in Deuteronomy chapter 4, it is more overtly referring to astrology, although some may argue from semantics that merely reading the stars is not the same as worshiping them. So was astrology always forbidden by God? He didn't necessarily seem to think so when he was creating the world. This is what it says in Genesis. And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. Genesis 1, verses 14 through 15. In Genesis, it seems like God is setting the stars in the sky to be used for tracking seasons, days, and years, but not for divining other things. So is astrology allowed or forbidden? Maybe the answer is somewhere in between, somewhere in understanding the difference between using the stars as a calendar and using the stars to determine how to live your entire life. Let's come back to this question later and look at a couple of examples of astrology in the Bible where you might not have expected to find it. In the book of Joshua, during the conquest of Canaan, Joshua asked God for the sun to stand still and the moon to stop. Here is what the passage says. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Aijalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation took vengeance on their enemies, as it is written in the book of Jasher. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. Joshua 10, verses 12 through 13. This appears to be a miraculous event. The sun stopped moving in the sky and did not set for the entire day. Skeptics will say this just isn't possible, as for the sun to stop moving in the sky, the earth would have to stop rotating, which would have catastrophic effects. Many of the faithful might say it's a miracle of God, and God can make it happen or appear to happen without it causing any catastrophic effects. But why did no other ancient culture report this happening on that day? I guess you can take it a step further and say that God only made it appear to happen for the people in the region of Canaan at the time. But this might be a case of modern audiences not understanding the context of the passage of the way the ancient people of the Middle Eastern region would have understood it. For that matter, the context might have been lost on the medieval reader and maybe even some later readers from the ancient period. What this passage may more likely be referring to is an omen. The word translating as standing still may not be translated as well and could be translated as waiting. Omens could be interpreted as good or bad. Ancient Middle Eastern sky watchers thought the timing and position of the sun and moon could be important in determining the outcome of battles. The beginning of the month was determined by the appearance of the new moon, and the length of the month could be determined by when the full moon appeared. The day on which the sun and the full moon appeared in the sky together at the same time would be taken into consideration as to whether or not it was a good time to fight a battle. The ancient Middle Eastern sky watchers thought if the full moon and sun were seen in the sky together on the 14th day of the month, it was considered a good omen. 
On the 15th day, it would be considered a bad omen, or if the weather made it so that it couldn't be determined when the sun and full moon were in the sky together on a certain day, that may be interpreted as a bad omen as well. So the sun waiting in the sky doesn't necessarily have to mean the sun literally stopped moving, but that it was seen in the sky in the same time as the moon. So to the ancient astrologers, since the sun and moon were usually seen in the sky at separate times, seeing them together at the same time meant to them that one had waited for the other. Or at least maybe that's the best way it could be translated into modern English. Interestingly, in the next passage it says the Amorite kings, who the Israelites would have been facing in battle, fled the area. I don't know exactly what day it was or what time of the day it was, but it seems that Joshua was not praying for God to show him a good omen, but for God to show the Amorites a bad omen, since they were the ones who followed astrology. Joshua, who had put his faith in God, was apparently unconcerned with the omen itself, but must have known the Amorites would have taken it seriously, so it seems like his prayer was for the Amorites to see what they would interpret as a bad omen. People have long wondered what the star that led the Magi to Jesus' birth is. Was it something supernatural? Did it actually move? Was it a UFO? Or is the explanation more simple than that? The explanation is probably not that complicated when you consider that it is most likely an astrological sign. The Magi came from the east, and part of being a wise man in Persia in those days likely included knowing astrology. These Magi would have been watching the sky and reading what they interpreted to be signs in the sky. Considering that after the Babylonian exile, some of the Hebrew people stayed behind in Babylon, these Magi may have been familiar with Hebrew customs, and may have actually been descendants of Hebrew people who had stayed behind in Babylon after after the exile. With that in mind, the position of the stars in the sky at a certain point in time might be what indicated to them the Savior had been born in Bethlehem. So what would the Magi have been looking for in the sky? Since our current dating system is based on Christ's birth, you might assume Christ was born in the year 0 or 1 AD. But modern scholars often put his birth at around 4 to 6 BC. This is mostly because Matthew and Luke both place Christ's birth just before the death of Herod the Great. And it's said by the historian Josephus that Herod's death occurred shortly after a lunar eclipse. It's thought the eclipse in March of 4 BC is most likely the eclipse mentioned. Some say it could have been up to two years earlier based on the record of Herod ordering the death of the innocents under age two. However, others have dated Jesus' birth at 1 or 2 BC based on working backwards from the age Jesus was when he began preaching and using Luke's statement that John the Baptist began baptizing people in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar as a reference point. It's also said that Herod's death may have been as late as the January eclipse of 1 BC, or another eclipse even later in the year on December 29th, 1 BC. From a calendar standpoint, the December 1 BC might seem like the most likely, because that would basically start the calendar with Jesus' birth right around 1 AD, like you would expect it to be. But what did the Magi see that alerted them to the King of the Jews being born? There are maybe a couple of possibilities. One possibility is the conjunction of Jupiter and Venus on June 17th, 2 BC. The planets lined up so closely they would have appeared to touch each other. Calculations have indicated there hasn't been a brighter conjunction of Venus and Jupiter so near the bright star Regulus in the constellation of Leo in the 2,000 years prior to that or since. Jupiter, a planet, was associated with kingship and the birth of kings, while Regulus, the brightest star in the constellation of Leo, is also associated with kingship. Venus was associated with motherhood and fertility. Jupiter and Venus coming together may have indicated a marriage union and occurring within the constellation of Leo would have associated with the tribe of Judah, which is often symbolized with a lion. So since Jupiter, which is associated with the birth of kings, appeared together with Venus in the constellation of Leo that has the king star Regulus in it, this may have been a clear sign to the astrologers that the king of the Jews had been born in the tribe of Judah. Jupiter and Venus coming together and getting brighter sounds like a likely candidate for the star of Bethlehem, but there may be another conjunction on September 11th, 3 BC, that is also related to this event and is actually described later in the Bible in the book of Revelation. The passage is from Revelation 12. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. 
The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Revelation 12, verses 1 through 6. When Jupiter and Regulus overlapped in the constellation of Leo, Leo was above the constellation of Virgo, which is associated with virginity. Below Virgo was Scorpio, which could be the dragon, but it's also possible that Hydra was the dragon. Considering in the next chapter the dragon is depicted as given its power to the beast of the sea, the Hydra might be the most likely option of the two here. The conjunction on June 17th, 2 BC, may have been the star the astrologers needed to find the way, although the conjunction setting all of this up probably started back in September 3 BC. To date the birth of Christ, scholars typically use statements from the Gospels with other non-biblical historical records and add a little bit of speculation to come up with their answers for the year Christ was born. I think the date of 4 BC is early. I think it is likely more accurate, especially considering the astrological conjunctions and the travel time of the Magi, that Christ was born around 2 or 1 BC. I don't know that it's super important to be able to pinpoint the exact year of Christ's birth definitively, but I think the evidence suggests that he was actually born around the time you would assume he was born. He was likely born in 1 BC, and the next year became 1 AD. Some people have tried hard to find astrological connections in other places in the Bible. Some think Ezekiel's vision of the four living creatures and then a future city of 12 gates for each direction as representing the zodiac. Some think there being 12 tribes of Israel and 12 apostles of Christ as somehow representing the 12 signs of the zodiac. I don't know that there is really any connection there, as it's probably just a coincidence they are reading too much into, or it may be inferring too much into their using non-canon sources. But there is evidence of ancient Jews displaying the zodiac in their synagogues. A 6th century AD synagogue in Beth Alpha has a floor mosaic depicting a zodiac wheel in its central panel. The northern panel depicts a story from Genesis with Abraham and Isaac, and the southern panel depicts a liturgical-oriented scene of a Torah shrine with menorahs. The synagogue at Hamat Tiberias is built on a site where archaeologists found evidence for a 1st century AD public building on the site, and then a synagogue built on the site in the 3rd century AD. The synagogue was rebuilt in the 4th century and contains a floor mosaic depicting the zodiac. Like the later synagogue at Beth Alpha, the mosaic here also depicts a Torah shrine with menorahs. So are the Jewish people of the Greco-Roman world adopted astrology? This is one of those questions there doesn't seem to be a def definite answer to. Some would say yes, it is evidence that rabbinical Jews had adapted astrology into their theology. Others would say it is just an ubiquitous symbol of divine order from that period of time. I'm not sure which view is correct, but I'm inclined to think the latter view is probably more accurate. There is a commandment against worship and graven images, and this commandment is something that was later carried over into Islam, and is why Islamic art never features any depictions of people or animals, but instead only has different styles of artistic designs. But I think the Jews of the Greco-Roman world, and possibly even in some earlier times, knew the difference between worshiping an image and an image that could tell a story or relay some kind of information to the viewer. Images telling a story or relaying some kind of information could be particularly beneficial in a location where there were a lot of illiterate people, although I'm not sure what the literacy rate in the 6th century Palestine was. The mosaic at Beth Alpha isn't just a depiction of the Zodiac, but also a depiction of a story from Genesis, and a depiction of how a Torah shrine should be set up. So you have a depiction of a story, and a depiction that relays a type of information. I doubt those images were worshipped, but they were there to be informative. A depiction of the Zodiac with pagan imagery may seem like that is stretching it too far. Yeah, I don't know, maybe it is. I don't know that it is up to me to decide that. But I think the purpose of it may have simply been just a way for them to depict a calendar. The Jewish calendar had 12 months and they knew of four seasons. Historically, the first temple era ancestors and earlier ancestors may not have had any way of depicting the calendar using imagery, 
so they might not have had a historical precedent within their own culture to use when depicting a calendar. It's important to remember that rabbinical Judaism is something that evolved out of the sect known as the Pharisees from the first century AD. Although still based on the Torah of their ancestors, the rabbinical Judaism from the sixth century had changed a lot since the time of the patriarchs and the first temple era Hebrews. They no longer did animal sacrifices and now a lot of the new texts have been added to their theology, compiled together in a text called the Talmud. At this point in time, the Jews have been living in a Greco-Roman world for many generations, and if they didn't have any ancient imagery of their own for depicting a calendar, they may have just adopted imagery from the culture around them. I doubt they considered it an object to be worshipped. So going back to the question asked earlier, is astrology allowed or forbidden? Let's look at a few more passages. Let now the astrologers, those who prophesy by the stars, those who predict by the new moons, stand up and save you from what will come upon you. Isaiah 47 verse 13. In this passage, God taunts an enemy power by saying the astrologers can't stop him. This reminds me of the story in the second chapter of Daniel, where God shows Daniel the meaning of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream when the king's astrologers couldn't figure it out. Here's another passage. And a word came into his heart, and he said, All the signs of the stars and the signs of the moon and of the sun are all in the hand of the Lord. Why do I search them out? Jubilees 12, verse 17. That was a thought of Abraham. In these passages, I think it is clear that God is saying it is not the stars and how they move that controls the universe, but it is him that controls the universe. Stars are set in a consistent motion that sky watchers can use to track seasons, and they might be able to track things beyond just the seasons of the world. But ultimately, God can supersede what those signs might show. So I think the message here is, feel free to keep track of the time and location using the stars, but don't put your faith in them for much more than anything other than that. Those are my thoughts on that. Thanks for listening.